The McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom is a legendary aircraft. Carrier-based, two-place, twin-engine, long-range, and supersonic. The F-4 was a highly versatile interceptor, fighter, and bomber used by the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marines. The Phantom was in service from 1961 to 1996, from Vietnam to Desert Storm and it became one of the best-known aircraft of the Cold War. It was constantly upgraded, and it set more than a dozen world records for in-flight performance, including speed and altitude records. It flew with the Navy's Blue Angels. And in Vietnam, it became the number one air superiority fighter for all three U.S. military branches. In 1972, flying an F-4J Phantom II, a pair of U.S. Navy aviators became the Navy's only air aces of the Vietnam War by achieving five confirmed aerial victories against the North Vietnamese MiG fighter aircraft. Randall Duke Cunningham, enlisted in the U.S. Navy in 1967 and served 20 years as a Navy officer and pilot. In pilot training, he graduated in the top of his class and was assigned to the F-4 Phantom II. The Phantom was a large airplane, not as agile as the MiG-17s and MiG-21s flown by the North Vietnamese, but Duke learned to exploit its strengths and compensate for its shortcomings. Early versions of the F-4 had no internal cannon, relying only on missiles for air-to-air -air combat. Duke served his first combat tour in Vietnam aboard USS America and then graduated from the U.S. Navy Fighter Weapons School, better known as Top Gun. In 1971, he returned to Vietnam aboard the USS Constellation. Willie Driscoll earned his naval aviator wings in 1968 and was assigned the F-4 Phantom II as a radar intercept officer, or RIO for short. The F-4's two-man crew was developed to make the best use of the air-to-air -air missiles used in aerial combat. In Vietnam, Willie rode as Duke's RIO, flying from the USS Constellation in the F-4J Phantom II the Duke named Showtime 100. In January 1972, Duke and Willie engaged a North Vietnamese MiG-21 and shot it down, their first kill. On May 8, they caught up with a North Vietnamese MiG-17 and shot it down. Two days later, Duke and Willie were on a bombing mission over North Vietnam. After they bombed their ground target, they engaged 16 MiG interceptors that were attacking a formation of B-52 bombers. In the ensuing dogfight, Duke and Willie shot down two MiG-17s. Alone and separated from their attack group, they headed toward the coast and the carrier. On the way, they found a single MiG-17 and shot it down. Leaving that encounter, their Phantom was hit by a missile. With their F-4 too crippled to reach the carrier, they ejected over the Gulf of Tonkin. They were picked up by a helicopter and returned safely to the Constellation. Five aerial victories make an ace, and that day, Duke and Willie became the first American aces in Vietnam. At war's end, 
They remain the only U.S. Navy aces from that conflict, and they are still the Navy's most recent ace fighter pilots. Both men received the Navy Cross for their actions that day. Both men later became instructors at Top Gun, and each held other positions in the Navy before retiring with the rank of commander. In the years after Vietnam, Duke became well acquainted with many of the North Vietnamese pilots he had fought against and with their families. Meeting his old adversaries, he said, I made some very good friends and gained a different respect. He was born in Los Angeles, the son of old-fashioned and patriotic parents who instilled in him the principles of courage and individual responsibility. Those values would serve him well in life, first as a boy playing sports, then as a coach in college, and finally as a naval aviator. Sheer will, determination, and skill made him Vietnam's first ace. Experience and talent helped him shape the next generation of pilots as an instructor at Top Gun, the Navy's fighter weapons school. The inspiration for the Hollywood action drama Top Gun, his unique style and personality are his trademarks. As a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, he fights for the military with the same determination he fought the enemy over the skies of Vietnam. His legendary spirit makes him one of the most storied fighter pilots of the 20th century. His name is Randy Duke Cunningham, and he is a legend of air power. Randall Harold Cunningham was born on December 8, 1941 in Los Angeles, California the oldest son of Randall and Leela Cunningham. Young Randy's early years in California were modest. His father owned and operated a filling station in Fresno, while his mother looked after Randy and younger brother Rob. His parents instilled respect for both country and family, and he grew up calling his six foot two, 230 pound weightlifting father, Sir. But had it not been for a peculiar event during an outing with his mother when he was a young boy, Randy's childhood might have been mostly uneventful. We were in a fish pond area, and I think it's still there, and there's a ledge maybe three feet high in this fish pond, and I jumped up on the wall and proceeded to fall into the water. And as my mom, of course, ran over to pull me out, there was, according to my mom, this like soothsayer that came along and says, well, uh, your son is going to become a very famous pilot someday. It was hardly a believable prediction at the time. Randy was too young to understand, and his mother dismissed the notion. Nevertheless, it would prove to be a stark forecast of his future as an accomplished aviator. When he was in junior high, Randy's father sold the filling station and moved the family east to Shelbina, Missouri. Population, 2,113. Randy spent his high school years in this small farming town where his father was the mayor and ran a five and dime store. Like many of the boys in his community, he grew up with football, basketball, and swimming. So it was only natural that sports became his calling. As a student at the University of Missouri, he landed a job coaching football and swimming at Illinois' Hinsdale High School. Three of his athletes went on to win Olympic medals. But another curiosity was beginning to pique his interest, flying. He took his first lesson at the Hinsdale Airport outside Chicago. I uh, got in with an Air Force colonel and who was retired and the very first time I flew it was maybe like a concert pianist that's a child prodigy feels comfortable playing a piano I felt like I had been reborn in an airplane it, it seemed easy to me it was something that I enjoyed Cunningham continued to fly and coach sports until graduating from the University of Missouri with a master's degree in 1965 Randy felt a calling to do his part by serving his country Flying fighters was what he now wanted to do, and the U.S. Navy offered him that opportunity. The training was tough, but so was Cunningham. The discipline he learned from his parents kept him sharp and focused, leading him to graduate at the top of his class at Pensacola in 1966. From there, it was on to secondary jet training, where he impressed his instructors enough to land him orders to Top Gun, 
the Navy's Fighter Weapons School. Haken rookie, uh, port 090 for the bogeys. Out of your turn, uh, bogeys will bear 090. Top Gun was where the Navy's best flyers learned to be elite fighter pilots. And it was there that Randy learned the advanced aerial tactics that made him a superior pilot. And sir, you're about to get gunned. Oh, what a beautiful shot. It was as if the prediction of that peculiar fortune teller from his boyhood was coming true. Randy Cunningham was on his way to becoming a famous aviator. But the future ace also had a trademark personality. A fan of John Wayne movies, he was nicknamed Duke by his shipmates and even adopted it as his call sign. The name fit Cunningham's character, tough and bold, with a desire to engage the enemy. That desire would soon be met. Cunningham's first combat cruise aboard the USS America was mostly uneventful. President Lyndon Johnson had halted the bombing of North Vietnam in an effort to jumpstart the stalled peace talks. But Johnson's strategy backfired. Flying missions in his F-4 Phantom, Duke noted that the enemy was using the lull to fortify its positions. American pilots were also forbidden to fire on North Vietnamese pilots first, allowing enemy flyers to retreat into China or back into North Vietnam where American pilots could not follow. Johnson's war strategy forced the military to follow a set of rules that gave every advantage to the enemy. The rule of engagement uh, at one of the parts during the war said that you can't shoot at a MiG unless he shoots at you first. We weren't going up north. And the guy that wrote that rule never strapped himself into an airplane because if you let a MiG get behind you, you give him a tremendous advantage and chances are you're gonna die. Further complicating matters, the war was unpopular with many Americans and there was unrest at home. The basic message of the anti-war protesters was, let's get out, let's go home. Let's not be fighting where we're not wanted. I think it's good to remember that the American public at no time went under 50% in support of the president, President Johnson. I do not find it easy to send the flower of our youth, our finest young men, into battle. We did not choose to be the guardians at the gate. But there is no one else. Nor would surrender in Vietnam bring peace. Because we learned from Hitler at Munich that success only feeds the appetite of aggression. I do support very strongly a person's right to protest within certain limits, within the laws. Uh, I sat down after the war with anti-war protesters and, and sat down and discussed uh, in a rational means their feelings, and I respect that. So help me God. But by that point in the war, the strategy had changed. Richard Nixon was now president, and he reversed Johnson's policy, stepping up the bombing of North Vietnam. Duke yearned for the chance to engage an enemy fighter, feeling that victory would be his. Uh, I was very confident. I, I was lucky. I had a good machine. I had good training. We had commanding officers and leaders that would allow us to train and do as much as we could to prepare ourselves uh, for combat. But Duke knew there was a chance he could become a casualty. And to avoid that, he meticulously studied the rules of aerial combat. You fight like you train, he told himself as he analyzed the differences between his aircraft and the enemy's. Top Gun taught him the techniques to make his American-made F-4 Phantom outmaneuver the more agile Russian MiG-17s, 19s, and 21s flown by the North Vietnamese. And he would need those skills in combat. The F-4 used missiles instead of a cannon for defense, meaning that the F-4 pilot had to outfly the enemy to win a dogfight. But skill was only half the battle. A good F-4 pilot had a dependable radar intercept officer in the back seat. Willie Driscoll was the other half of the team, keeping Duke aware of enemy aircraft and other hostile situations. Their partnership got them through thick and thin, but it would be put to the test on January 19, 1972, as they closed in on a formation of North Vietnamese MiG-21s. 
And as I started closing and I got a sidewinder tone, I shot the first missile. And as the missile came off, uh, this guy went into about a 9G turn. And the missile tried to come around the corner and it exploded out in this position. And closing him really fast, because I'm now starting to get in too close to fire my second missile, he just dropped the wing to start to turn and I shot the second missile. And what it did, it really set him up because it moved my his tailpipe right in dead six o'clock position. And the, the missile went through his aircraft, knocked off the whole tail of the airplane, and then he tumbled. It was the first MiG kill for an American pilot in two years. An enthusiastic crowd awaited Duke and Willie Driscoll as they landed on the USS Constellation. There were 5,000 guys up on the fly deck. Captain James D. Ward was skipper of the, uh, the Constellation. Uh, Admiral Hutch Cooper was the uh, commander of Task Force 77 was up there. All the guys were cheering. But the experience of Duke's first aerial combat victory was bittersweet. All of his training couldn't prepare him for what he faced after landing. And I remember that one of the guys came up to me and says, Duke, what does it feel like to kill somebody? And I hadn't really thought of it in that context. It wasn't, it wasn't close in and personal at that point. And I remember all of a sudden it just hit me like a ton of, of bricks. Uh, and it really bothered me. But bad feelings couldn't keep Randy out of the cockpit. Within a few days, he was back to flying missions. And it wouldn't be long before the enemy tried to take on Duke Cunningham once again. It was May 8, 1972, when Duke and wingman Brian Grant engaged a formation of attacking MiG-17s. One less MiG made it back. Two MiG-17s crossed on either side of our aircraft, just right over, just very close aboard, 180 out. Now, normally you'd think, okay, they're going the opposite direction, we're going that way, so that they're going to be out of the fight because the whole fight's moving this way and there's no way that they can catch us. And Willie looked back and saw these guys actually turn inside of each, of each other coming down on us. Now in the meantime, Brian is in, in, a, in a turn like this with this guy on him, and I came in at a very high angle for this guy and fired a missile, and he actually broke into the missile as it came like this, and again, he dropped his wing and went right, I don't know why, what happened, but the missile went right up his tailpipe and he blew up. It was just two days later on May 10th, 1972, when Duke and Willie again hit pay dirt. This time they would be part of one of the most historic days in naval aviation history. a strike mission on a rail center in North Vietnam, they encountered a MiG-17 attack. He was going 400 plus knots at me, and uh, with that closure, he doesn't have hydraulically boosted controls in that MiG, which you know everything about the enemy that you can. And it takes a big gomer to pull on that pole, you know, to get that airplane to turn in there going that speed. So I saw the closure. I said, MiG-17, no hydraulically boosted controls. I broke into him like this, and he overshot my flight path. Duke recognized the MiG's disadvantage and moved in for the kill. As this guy overshot like this, I reversed and squeezed the trigger. He was actually in min range when I pulled the trigger, but by the time that the missile came off, he was out pretty far, and the airplane exploded. But there was no time to celebrate. Looking down, Randy noticed that many more MiGs had joined the battle, and that his executive officer, Commander Dwight Tim, was in trouble. And I looked down, and there was our executive officer, in a defensive wheel with eight MiG-17s. And the theory the MiGs had, that if they're flying like this in a circle, if you come down after one, somebody's already gonna be behind you. It's a dumb tactic, but that's what they, they tried to do. Duke hesitated at the situation. Defending Commander Tam would probably cost him his life, but he couldn't leave without trying to help. And I remember thinking about, I said, if I leave him, he's gonna die. And I said, I don't know how I'm going to live with myself and look his family in the eyes when he doesn't come back. And I remember thinking, you know, I just went, damn. You know, and I took the airplane and I just and it made the decision, so I've got to go back. And, and at that point, I thought I was going to die. 
Putting his natural fears aside, Cunningham dove in but held his fire. He called for Commander Tim to break right, and when he did, Duke released another Sidewinder missile. It set up the MiG exactly like I wanted to, and I shot, and he blew up. The, the missile traveled through the entire length of his airplane, and his airplane just exploded. But Duke and Driscoll's day was far from over. As they separated from the enemy aircraft and headed out towards the Gulf of Tonkin, another MiG came straight at them. Well, I had closed this MiG, and I'm closing right down, and I'm going to pass right and take the paint off of his airplane if I have to. And all of a sudden, his wing roots lit up with guns. Duke had no idea that he was up against the famed Colonel Toon, an ace in his own right for the North Vietnamese. Cunningham pulled straight up, a maneuver he thought the MiG would not follow, since they almost always avoided vertical engagements with F-4s. To his amazement, the MiG followed his every move. For the next three and one half minutes, Cunningham fought for his life as the two planes maneuvered vertical, then horizontal, trying to gain an advantage for the kill. Matched move for move, Randy changed his technique. And I remember thinking, well, this worked in training. <laughs> it better work now or I'm dead. So I pulled the power, hit the speed brakes, dropped the half flaps, and this guy went whoosh, right out in front of me. Realizing he was well matched, the MiG pilot tried to run, but Duke wasn't ready to quit. So I said, if he's going to run, I'm not going to. Drop the wing, just put the, the uh, rudder into the airplane like this, got a sidewinder tone and shot him. The missile came off and he blew up. The remaining MiGs retreated, and Duke headed back over the water and toward the USS Constellation. Cunningham and Driscoll were the first US aces of the Vietnam War, having shot down five of the enemy. But their day wasn't over yet. Without radar warning, a surface-to-air missile exploded nearby, causing their F-4 Phantom to lose control. And the airplane kind of rolled and went out of control upside down. Now, I remember thinking, at this time, I'm going to be a prisoner. And I said, God, get me out of this. I don't want to be a prisoner of war. Duke managed to keep control of his aircraft for 40 miles, using only the rudder and afterburner. But his plane was damaged too badly for him to make a safe landing. His only option was to eject and risk parachuting into enemy territory. I had always briefed Willie that, that I would say, Willie, eject, 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 three times. And I only got out Willie E and bang, he was gone. And he knew it was time to get out of the airplane. The US Marines sent in a helicopter to rescue the downed fighters before the enemy could get them and they were escorted back to the USS Constellation. On deck, an enthusiastic crowd awaited Vietnam's first aces. Injuries to Duke's back and leg from the ejection put the day's events into perspective. All that emotion just hit at once uh, from the whole day. Uh, if you take fear, anger, hate, magnify it a thousand times, that kind of emotion and that kind of a rush, uh, and all of a sudden that realization just hit me and I remember when I got on the ship, I mean just being alive, being back on the ship with, with my fellow pilots and crew members, uh, it was pretty tough. Cunningham and Driscoll would be the only crew to shoot down five enemy fighters with missiles and the only ones to shoot down three in a single mission. Ironically, it also marked the end of their combat careers. My skipper came in Al Newman and says, uh, Duke, we want uh, you and Willie to go back to the States and the war is unpopular. We want you to, you know, to kind of travel and tell people what's really happening over here. And I said, no, sir. I mean, my squadron mates are out there risking their lives. And, and the last thing I want to do is go back on a PR tour. I want to stay here and, and, and be part, you know, of the team like I always have been. And he, he made a statement, he says, well, Duke, there's a lot of guys can do what you do, and you, this is important for you. And I remember telling him, I says, no, there's not, Skipper. But the Navy had other plans for the two flyers, sending Duke and Willie touring the U.S. for several months following their return. Randy Cunningham and Bill Driscoll are eagles of today. Pilot and radar intercept officer, RIO. They are the first dual aces 
a designation hard won in skies over North Vietnam. There are certain things that we could talk about in fighter air-to-air -air tactics, and we could talk with a World War I fighter pilot, a World War II fighter pilot, and the things that we would talk about would be almost exactly identically the same. We, we have a, a firm belief at the Navy Fighter Weapons School, the first man to see the other man is probably going to win, and if he doesn't win, he's probably not going to lose, be it on radar or be it through eyeball. The biggest difference that we face is that we only saw MiGs three times, and one time there was a massive MiGs up. And then Duke went back to his first love, flying fighters, and he taught others too. Returning the favor he received when he attended Top Gun, Randy became an instructor at the famed Fighter Weapons School at Naval Air Station Miramar. Even Hollywood jumped on the Duke Cunningham bandwagon, using his experiences and personality as the inspiration for Tom Cruise's character in the 1986 action drama, Top Gun. I gave him about 30 or 40 different things that had happened to me in my life, and other people had done similar things, not just Duke Cunningham, but uh, for example, I met my wife by singing You Lost That Loving Feeling to her at the Miramar Officers Club. Um, I had flown upside down on a Russian and communicated with him when he tried to fly me into the water. Randy Cunningham retired from the Navy in 1987 at the rank of commander. For his distinguished service in Vietnam, he was awarded the Navy Cross, two silver stars, 15 air medals, the Purple Heart, and was also decorated by the South Vietnamese government. His Navy career over, Duke went back to school earning a master's degree in business administration from National University. Three years later, a successful run for Congress landed him in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the 51st District of California in San Diego. As a member of the House Appropriations Committee and the National Security Subcommittee, he fights for the military's interests, just as he fought the enemy over the skies of Vietnam. A brilliant aviator, a brave combat pilot, Randy Duke Cunningham, will be remembered as an educator, a legislator, but most of all, as a legend of air power. And then I'm going to ask one more favor today, and it's a little bit different. I'm going to ask to see how many fighter pilots, how many military fighter pilots we have in the audience. Please stand up. We got, wow, wow. Again, thank you very much. Um, and, and that's what I was also. Uh, and, and I got to say that, um, you know, these guys back then uh, were my heroes or continue to be my heroes. You know, you take a look at the, uh, the lettering out here, history, heroes, and heritage. We got it all out here today right now. Um, I, I'm about a 2,000-hour Phantom pilot. I started flying the, uh, the airplane in about 1976. And these guys back then were the guys I wanted to be. These were the guys who had five mid kills, um, three in one mission, um, and that's that's what I trained. I, I I trained to be the best guy I could be in the airplane. And listening, reading their stories, uh, Duke's got a book called Fox Two. Um, I also read the uh, how about and kill Migs. I, I remember I read that book and kill Migs. I think it was a Lou Drendel book. I went through every engagement that they went through, and uh, I could probably repeat them today. But uh, but that that's that's the story. And uh, and yeah, the way we're going to run things today, we're on a tight schedule. We got to be out of here by 11 o'clock. Uh, and what we're going to do is talk a little bit about the airplane and the crew concept and the weapon system. Then we're going to get into their story, and it's probably not going to have a lot of time. I'll, I'll probably say, hey, let's talk about that, that last story where he got three MiGs and got shot down. Um, and then we'll open it up to Randy for a quick second, and I thank you, Randy, for having the airplane here. The original concept, of course, was to have what? An F-4. If we could have an F-4J here, that would have been great. You know, That's what these guys used to, uh, to kill that airplane. Connie and I talked about it. We said, hey, you know, what, uh, what else can we do? And, uh, you know, they're Navy guys, so we said, okay, we, it was going to be an A-4 over there, and Duke had A-4 time when he was flying Top Gun, and, uh, and Willie, of course, is a high time. I can't, how many hours in the F-14? You said 2,200. 2,200. 22 hours of Tomcat time. Um, 
and we couldn't get that. So we sat there and we said, okay, so we'll have a little Navy representation here. But then I said, hey, Connie, they, I, they shot down four MiG-17s. We got any MiGs around? And she goes, well, as a matter of fact, we do. And Randy jumped in there and said, yes, indeed. Uh, I'm proud to be here. And he's, by the way, he's a demo pilot. He's a high-time MiG pilot in the world, I think. But you've probably watched him fly at night. He's going to be flying again this afternoon. And, uh, and it's a beautiful, beautiful airplane. We'll do a quick walk around uh, at the very end, and we'll open up the question. But that's kind of what we're going to start uh, the program. And uh, I'll say now, the Phantom, you know, most of you guys, it, it's, it's an outdated airplane now. Uh, like I said, I had a couple thousand hours in the thing, but it, it is a crew served weapon system. Um, and you got to understand that it's not just one guy. Yeah, you know, the F-16, the, the F-22, they're, they're now single seat. Um, but no, back then it was a, a crew served weapon system. So you had the guy in the front and the guy in the back. Uh, the guy in the front, obviously the pilot. Uh, the guy in the back, hey, you know what, what they called, and they, they called them Rios, we called them Wizzos, we called them the Gibbs, guys in the back. Um, a lot of different terms. But uh, each one had a particular job, and I'm going to open it up with Willie and just say, okay, you know, hey, here you are at war, um, you're dropping bombs one day, you're killing MiGs another day, you know, what, what was his job in the back seat? What did he do? So, Willie, I'll open it up to you. Yes, sir. Uh, first off, thanks for having us, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, my job was to, uh, several different things. To uh, First off, to run the radar to find out where the enemy threats were coming from. Let, let Randy know what was, was happening and, and be able to help him once the dogfight started. Uh, secondly, to run the electronic countermeasures equipment, you know, to pre-flight it, make sure it was working correctly so we could know who was looking at us and where the shots, the enemy shots were coming from. The third job was to run the electronic counter countermeasure equipment to make sure we were responding appropriately to the electronic threats that were, were tracking us. And the fourth job was to, and these were all, they could, they could, job four could all of a sudden become job one at a, at a very quick time, timeline there. And the fourth job was to uh, help with the navigation. In other words, many times out of these fights, he'd say, Willie, give me a heading out of here. And I would give up the heading, making sure we were avoiding the uh, service tab missile sites. And we flew 170 combat missions together. Uh, the way the Navy did it was you flew with the same, the same pilot for all of your missions. If one of us had the duty, the other guy normally wouldn't fly that day. Or they, you might fly sometimes with another person, but that was rare. And I've been asked many times, so how did you and uh, Duke Cunningham get along so well for all that time and what you did in combat? And I tried to keep th three simple rules in mind. Number one, if something bad happened, I did it. If something good happened, we did it. If something great happened, he did it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. All right, so Duke, what was your job up front? What you know? Uh, yeah, you did that that pilot stuff, as they, they said in Top Gun. There. Uh, well, I had to listen to Willie. You know, I'm going to do something I'm not supposed to. Trump. <laughs> um, it, it. You just had to know what your enemy was. This this airplane right here, it looks better on fire. <laughs> Sorry, Randy. That's all right. <laughs> the uh, but you you train uh, to to know what the enemy has so that you can do it. Area fifty one. We were uh, gifted to be able to fly against MiG seventeens and MiG twenty ones, so we had a, a pretty good idea on what to do. Uh, we looked at the we had the radar that Willie ran. And Willie is the best backseater in the in the entire Navy. And I was very fortunate to have Willie. I picked Willie. Uh, I, my second tour, I could pick the RO I wanted. And uh, Willie had a Volkswagen with a beer keg in the back of it. And I, I said, that's the guy that I want. <laughs> And uh, Willie and I are like brothers uh, welded at the hip, uh, but we worked as a team. And the very first time that uh, first flights, uh, you know, I was pretty hard on Willie. Do this, do that, do this. And after a while, he started going, Duke, do this, do this. And I said, he's arrived. And that's when you become a team. Uh, I would do things. I know just like Willie 
we had a MiG-17 come in behind us like this, and Willie came up and said, do, do this pilot shit you know how to do before the wing coming. And I knew what he was, you know, to do. He knew where the threat was, and I could believe it. But I also know that somebody behind me, he was going to get it. Uh, the skills, I was very fortunate. The commanding officers that uh, we had uh, let us fly against dissimilar airplanes. We were in a Phantom, and the Air Force, a lot of times during that period, they could only fly F-4 against F-4. And when they got tangled with a tight-turning MiG-21 or 17 or 19, they, it was hard for them. And we were able to do that, and I was able to go through uh, from anything that had wings on it, our commanding officer let us fly against it just to see the maneuverability that we could use to fight it. So I was very, very fortunate. Uh, I went through uh, Top Gun as a student uh, ahead of time as an instructor and then commanding officer of the 126. And all of those times, uh, you just love flying this thing. And I'm sure Randy will tell you. That's a noisy sucker. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It, it's I just so feel so gifted. And for you veterans, and especially for the wives out there, uh, the wives of a veteran, you've got it really tough when the when your your bros are going over there. And so God bless you, Duke. I got to ask you know some more of the pilot stuff that you did up up front. You know you're you're the guy pulling the trigger. You're the guy launching the missiles. Yeah. And uh, and most of your kills, from what I understand, were were uh, sidewinders. All uh, all five of them. I was gonna say I got to ask a question. Here's here's Willie in the back. You know with the radar and the only the only other we weapon system these guys had back then was the Sparrow missile. And uh, I guess they they recognized pretty early on that the Sparrow was very unreliable, but to do it, of course, Willie was a guy who had to sit there and lock on. You had to get the dot in the AC circle and all that kind of stuff back there. But uh, but did, did you kind of push that aside and just say, hey, you know, it, it, it's so unreliable that it's not worth shooting at these guys, and uh, you end up just shooting sidewinders at them? Is that uh, essentially yeah. what happened? The, the Sparrow kill probability only was 7%, and... Uh, the Sidewinder was 49%, so I knew if I got in firing range, I was going to use Sidewinder. I saw a picture with the Air Force shooting uh, three sparrows at one airplane, and the first one hit it. So those those statistics are, you know, a little foolish and the things like that. But we banged off the sparrow on an aircraft carrier where the Air Force could, you know, land on a nice, smooth, long runway have a nice dinner at night. I did, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, I got to also ask, a typical loadout on the, on the mission that you guys uh, shot down three, was that a strike mission that you were going on? Um, and, and your load at that point, were you carrying bombs and probably, what, four sparrow or four sidewinders and a couple sparrows? What was the load on that one? I, I believe the load was... Um... Uh, four sidewinder, two sparrow, and four rock eye. Okay. And well, our our mission was uh, we were going to uh, an enemy railroad uh, shipment yard called the Hydron Railroad Yard, and we were actually flying as flak suppressors. And when we rolled in, you know, the uh, getting to the target area was uh, uh, un very uneasily quiet. There was no threat uh, weapons being fired at us, which is unusual. We thought initially we were sneaking up on them, but I, I said, I don't think so. There's 25 Navy airplanes going in 45 miles in, 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 into enemy territory. So right when we got to the target, it opened up. Remember when Harry Blackburn and Steve Redloff got hit? And a lot of anti-aircraft, we actually uh, decided at that point to uh, get, unload our ordnance on where the threats were coming from. As I recall, our bombing run was a lot steeper than necessary, which I was okay with, by the way. And uh, <laughs> it, it was a lot faster, but we got rid of our rock eye. And they're a weapon that's it's, they're like a, a bunch of miniature hand grenades that scatter over a particular area. So it's a, it's a good anti-suppressant uh, against uh, uh, anti-aircraft type threats from the ground. And I remember as we were looking over our shoulder at where the, the bombs are going, uh, that's when we first picked up the enemy airplanes and the fighting started from there. Okay. And uh, a tur, a tur is a, a a bomb rack. It you're able to hold three uh, 500 pound bombs on it. 
And what hampered us to, uh, this day was we had just struck rock eye uh, on, on an uh, Hydwong railroad yard. And the problem was those turrs, the drag on it was tremendous. And if I got rid of the turrs, I got rid of my sidewinders. I couldn't get them separated. So when I went vertical, instead of going here, I would go up to this high and not have the, the separation that I needed. And that hampered us. But um, it was kind of tough on that thing. But the big 17, he turns at uh, 19 degrees a second. We only turn at uh, 12 degrees a second. So if I get if I get behind him and he turns, he can out, out turn us. So we use the vertical. But when you're taking away that vertical, it's a, a pretty tough fight. Were you guys carrying fuel tanks too? You used to carry a center line fuel tank, probably 600 gallon. Is that I it? got rid of the center line as soon as I saw that my uh, Brian Grant was my wingman. He said, Duke, make 17. As soon as I turned like this, I went bang. I had trained, even in my car, there's three switches, labs, ready, <laughs> direct, uh, pickle. <laughs> labs, ready, direct, enable us to uh, get rid of the center line, and all I had to do was boom. And when he said, make 17, I turned, and I got rid of the center line because they were already coming down and firing. Yeah, okay. Um, how about early warning? Did you have any, uh, you know... Uh, uh, any kind of warning that the MiGs were there other than your wingmen saying, hey, the MiGs are there. You know, we had we, we, we had some early warning stuff out there. So you, we probably knew that the MiGs had taken off, right? But uh, did, did you have any heads up that the MiGs were getting close to you guys? You know, they, they call that real-time information. And we had a very good uh, intelligence network monitoring what was going on from the enemy side. But we always had heavy debates with the intelligence community. Most of the time, they did not pass that information along to us. Now, we were controlled by a Navy ship called Red Crown. It was a call sign. They were about 150 miles away from us. So when we get down to low altitude, we'd sometimes lose radio transmission with them. And I remember when we came off that bombing run, we dropped the four rock eye, we were jinking back and forth. And I, I saw two black or some specks on the horizon. I thought they were Air Force airplanes. So didn't pay much attention to them, continued to scan across the ground. And then the black specks turned to be several MiG-17s coming up the left side. I called them out to Randy that we had bandits uh, uh, close on the left. He, he initially said, no joy, keep talking. I said, break left, they're approaching guns. And then he said, got them. And then from there, were they shooting at you then? No, they weren't. They were, okay. uh, and to this day, you might have a better feel for this than I do, wild man, but I don't know if they, if they saw us, but they flew right out in front of us. Okay, okay. You see this big, Gun right here, which they—that's a 37 millimeter gun. That thing, when it's shooting at you, puts out a fire like this. It looks like he <laughs> can kill you just with his flame. The other ones are 23 millimeter, but that 37 goes boom, 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 and the 23 goes lights up like that. That is an eye catcher. <laughs> okay, so the the first make that you, you, you saw and killed was a, a single shot. Sidewinder kill? Is that right? You said he didn't see you? Well, we came off target, and I'm coming like this. Brian says, Duke, make 17, 7 o'clock. <laughs> Another mistake I made, I said, Willie, look at that. Look at the target we just bombed because it was just obliterated. And that's when Brian said, make 7, 7 o'clock. As I reversed like this, these guys were coming down, uh, and I knew that he it had a big limitation. He does not have hydraulically boosted controls. And a MiG driver, a big gomer, trying to pull that airplane, it's hard for him. He had a lot of speed and his nose down. And two days prior to that, I had a MiG coming in on me like this, and I put 12 Gs on the airplane. I broke both hinges. The airplane was down for two months, and we <laughs> pulled it, but... Then he rendezvoused on me because he can outturn me, and I had to go into the clouds to get rid of him. But with this one, I, he had the speed. He had nose down. I broke into him like this. He Just as soon as he overshot, I reversed. He came out the other side, and because I had labs ready to direct arm, the only thing I had to do was pull the trigger. We had one of the guys in our squadron 
got behind a MiG-17, and he forgot to go to arm. Now I ask you, with a MiG this quick coming by, do you think I had time to throw four switches, reset the gun sight to 35 mils? No. But I did that on every mission that I bombed. I came up and went labs, ready, direct, and set 35 mils. So when that big pass there, I was ready. That's muscle memory, and that's what it, what it takes, again, because of the speed, as you said. And in the meantime now, so you're, you're killing this guy. Willie, are you keeping track of the second guy? There's another guy out there now. Could you see him? Well, right after the, uh, the first splash, I uh, looked over the left side and looked uh, like the Battle of Britain. The sky was full of enemy airplanes. So at that point, we weren't sure what was going on. I, mean, I, I know Randy was thinking about the, the advantage of our airplane with the power. So the, the, we were taught by Top Gun, uh, the term is drag the fight uphill. So we pulled up into the vertical and saw a, a, just a huge fight down the left side, you know, a lot of chatter on the radios, missiles, this kind of thing. And then we saw a Navy airplane, weren't sure who it was, and then two MiGs behind about a half mile, and the third MiG coming up, uh, looked like he was coming up to join on his wing. What he was actually doing was trying to get a sweeten up the shot. We're setting up here, so why don't you take it from there, Walman? We're up here. We see that's Dwight, Tim, and Jim Fox. So there's three down here, and you guys are up high, right? Okay. Yeah. Have Randy tell you about the roll rate and the yeah the pull on that airplane. Yeah, the airplane pitches very well, uh, and it turns great once you've got it rolled. But uh, once you've got it up at speed, uh, 350, 400 knots or faster, roll rate is is pretty pretty poor and that portion is hydraulically boosted, but it's it's not enough, and it needs roll spoilers, et cetera, to fix it. You push on the push on the stick as hard as you can, and I've had people say, "What that was such a such a graceful roll you made," and inside the cockpit, I'm doing this it, over here, trying to get it to roll. So, uh -huh. yeah. all right, yeah. so Duke, so Sue, you're up here. There's three down here chasing one of your buddies, and now did you just pick, you know, hey, the guy who's closest to your buddy? I mean, well, they were they had uh, a some of these MiGs in a circle. They call it a wagon wheel. They're flying in a circle, and if you get behind them, there's always a MiG behind you. That was their tactic. It's a screwed up tactic, but they're doing it. And as these MiGs were coming around, one of our Phantoms, our XO executive officer, was in a turn like this, and he had a MiG coming in. So I started down at him and I was waiting for him to turn in front of me and another F4 came and if he had added another coat of paint on the airplane we would have taken it off <laughs> because <laughs> I only missed it so I had to go back through that thing and come down and again that uh, when the airplane came around a thing like this it was easy because I just waited for him to turn his tail and squeeze and Blew him up off my XO's tail. Yeah, and the, and the aim nines that you were shooting the sidewinders back then, you, you really had to be pretty close to the tail of the airplane. The, the sidewinders now, you know, you've got the, the front aspect. Yeah. They got cooled seeker heads and all that kind of stuff. You guys didn't have that ability. You had to be back there, probably within 30 degrees or so, get a good tone, and then. Yeah, well, uh, Dwight Tim, my XO, he had a MiG 17 here and a MiG 21 here. And I wanted to shoot the MiG-21, but the 17 was the one that was going to hurt my XO. <laughs> yeah. So I ended up uh, shooting the MiG-17. His name was Nguyen Van Tu. Nguyen Van Tu, I was drinking scotch with him in Hanoi just a couple years ago. <laughs> and he said, Duke. Thanks for not picking me, the MiG-21 driver. <laughs> Another MiG driver came in, and he's the one that when he came around a turn like this, uh, he said, uh, I asked him, how come you didn't shoot at me? And that's when he said, Duke, I ran out of bullets. <laughs> so, wow. All right, so that's number two. Now there's, there's one more, and uh, this one sounded like you were on your way home. When you, when you found this guy, or, or, or trying to get feet wet, basically, right? Made a big mistake. Uh, when I was fighting a Top Gun instructor or something, I would try and close, uh, pass him close aboard, because if you're here, he uses that level of separation to turn on me and gain it. If I did, and I used to get it down for my instructor, but I said, you know, I got turned on him, so what? 
But it's, and so I told Willie, I said, Willie, what's this? I'm going to scare the sugar. That's not the word I use. I'm going to use, I'm going to scare the sugar out of this guy. And I pointed my nose right at him. In training, I never had somebody shoot at me for real in a gun. And his guns lit up, and I went, crime in it. He's got a gun in his nose. <laughs> and so when I broke, I broke into the vertical like this, expecting him. Because most of the bigs, MIGs, if they didn't have an advantage, they would run, and Hanoi was that way. So when I came up like this in the vertical, I looked back, and here was a MIG-17 going vertical, and I could see a little Gomer scarf, a little Gomer goggles, and we're going canopy <laughs> to canopy. So vertical rolling scissors is basically and what a roll, you got into. Yeah. Okay. That's what it turned into be a rolling scissors. Okay, and so now you're going up the hill. Eventually, that's going to stop, and you're going to point down. And this guy you ended up shooting? Well, I was really good at flying the Phantom slow, and I trained against it. And so when I got up here, I made another mistake. I gave him a predictable fight. So he shot ahead of me here, and so I rolled and pulled down and unloaded the airplane. He got speed, and he came down after me like this. So I said, okay, I'll put this guy in a rolling scissors. So I put about five, six Gs on this. And the air, he overshot, and he came down like this. And I remember thinking, okay, you rat, you're dead. And so I pulled the airplane like this, and I rolled it and twisted it like this. And I got my nose on him like that, and he broke and put and forced me to overshoot. That's called a rolling scissors. And uh, I said, this guy knows what he's doing. But you ended up getting him in the long run? In the movie Top Gun, you saw where the guy came back to idle, put his speed brakes out, and, and uh, the MIG overshot him. That's what I did. As he got in coming like this, and I had gone through that twice and disengaged from him, and this time I saw his nose come up, so I put the idle speed brakes, went half flaps, and he went whoop out in front of me. And now I'm sitting behind him, another mistake, is that the sidewinder, I have to have a 1,000 feet to be able for the missile to arm. I'm about 500 feet away from this guy, nose to tail, and I know he can outturn me. So I just started to drop the wing to disengage, and he did this like this, and he departed his airplane. And the airplane went down like this, and I said, well, if he's going to run, I'm not going to run. And I rolled, and I pulled the speed brakes again, and I got a tail nose-to-tail -tail separation and got the sidewinder tone, squeezed the trigger, and that was it. All right, so that was number three. Okay, now it's time to go home. And uh, you guys tried to go home, but uh, <clears throat> some telephone pole ended up uh, impacting uh, your airplane. What, what happened, Willie? Well, you know, after that fight, we're pretty excited. So we're talking back and forth. Uh, I mean, we're... Oh, you're Mick, and you're, you're an ace at that point. We're just, th we're just thinking we got through a really tough fight. Uh, as Randy described the way it started, what he didn't say was he used the word sugar. But when the, <laughs> when the MiG passed close aboard, he said, oh, shit. <laughs> That's the last thing a guy in the back seat wants to hear. <laughs> you're thinking, did the stick just fall off? Or, you know, but... Anyway, the rest of the story he told, and but we're pretty ha happy after that fight. It was a pretty fierce fight. As we're heading out and climbing, I'll never forget this. You said, give me a heading, 040, we're climbing to 28,500, 0.68 mark climb. Going to do an idle descent to the ship, hopefully to get to a tanker. But we're talking back and forth. We're not listening to the radios. I'm not looking at the radar. We're not looking at the electronic countermeasure equipment. We're just happy. All of a sudden, we hear this loud explosion. The plane bounces a little bit. I look out over the left side or the right side, and I see uh, an orange fire, uh, like an orange smoke, and the plane continued to fly okay. But I said that was a Sam, and and I, geez, we better get ourselves back together here. So, all of a sudden, we're we're, we're back in the plane in the moment. The plane continued to fly normally for about the next minute and a half or so. Everything seemed to be okay. I looked over my left side just to, to make sure there were no bandits that were chasing us. There had been two enemy airplanes holding low over, overhead the treetops. I kept thinking, I wonder why they're letting us escape. I, I thought it was foolish on their part at the time. I don't, later understood that they were bringing the surface to air threat up and they told these bandits to uh, loiter overhead the, the treetops. The bandits are now rapidly climbing toward our position. 
As I looked over the left side, I know that the turtle back area uh, where the fuel tanks are, there was a little bit of fire on the on the uh, head side of the airplane. I reported that to, to Randy. I called him wild man in the airplane. He always knew when it was me talking when I said uh, wild man. I said, wild man, uh, we got a little bit of flag going on the left side. He said, Willie said, Duke, we're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> And he told me that uh, I think first off we're losing PC2, and the plane started to fly on its own sideways. That's a hydraulic system. Uh, one of the way. hydraulic systems. There's there's three. The hydraulic system one we call PC1, hydraulic system two, and then the utility hydraulic system, which powered a lot of the flight controls on the airplane. So we're starting to lose uh, the hydraulic control. The plane is starting to fly sideways. Now it's a question where, and I think we got hit. We're probably 25 or so miles inside enemy territory. So now it's a question of whether we're going to get the airplane out to the coast or not. You know, Randy and I talk every year on the 10th of May, the day this occurred, and I always ask him each year, what was the, uh, the highlight of that day? And we, we talk back and forth. There's two guys that went through that would, would talk. And I always say, you know, Wild Man, I think the best flying you ever did was after we got hit. And he said, you know, Willie, I hate to tell you this, I wasn't flying the plane. <laughs> <laughs> But he somehow managed to get the plane up over to the coast. The plane went into heavy wing rock back and forth, flipped on its back, and we went into an inverted spin. Now, one of my jobs... And it's How the, high were you then? We are probably about 12,500. Okay, so we got hit at maybe uh, 25,000, 26,000, something okay. like that. So we're upside down right at the coast. Now, we have this thing. You probably haven't seen this in a while. <laughs> we have this thing called an ejection handle that sits between each of our legs. And there's also an ejection light that, that he might push if we needed to eject. But I knew this situation was extremist. So we're in this inverted spin. I'm squished against the top of the canopy. And it's, uh, there's a little bit of fire inside on, on the left-hand side. You know, the F-4 in the back seat has all these circuit breakers. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm thinking this, we, we have to get out of this airplane now. So they teach us. I'll stand up so you can see. They teach us to grab the handle and hold with your wrist. It's a, about a 30-pound pull toward your chin. It's a crisp pull. But I'm squished against the top of the canopy, and this is about the best I can do. And we're spinning, and I know if it's uncomfortable for me, it's really uncomfortable for him in the front seat. So I do a one-arm handstand with my left hand. Although they teach us this, I get the top of my two knuckles on the, on the top of the hand, and I figure that's probably the best I can do. I can still hear the instructor saying, feet flat on the deck, arms in, eyes above the horizon. And, then, and I said, if I try to sweeten this grip, I might lose the grip. So with this, I yank it. Bam, it fires. Off we go. The next thing I know, I look up and see the uh, orange and white parachute, and we're coming down to the mouth of the enemy's harbor. What the enemy does is they send out PT boats in our direction. You know, so we, we it wasn't time to relax right now. There's PT boats coming toward us. Randy and I were about a half mile apart. We could wave to each other in our parachutes coming down and give the international signal that I'm okay. You know, <laughs> as we came down, now I joined the Navy not knowing how to swim. I think you were. Yeah, it was a swimming hole. We were going through training. You were a swimming instructor, University of Missouri, if I recall. Uh, so anyway, I had a hard time, but but when I learned how to relax in the water, everything everything worked out okay. But for a guy like me to say water entry was uneventful, please consider the source. So, got out of the chute, got into my uh, raft, broadcast our position. I. Uh, we were, I was Showtime 100 Bravo. The enemy T boat, T boats were called skunks. And the Haiphong Harbor, where we ejected, that was called uh, Point 66. So I said, Showtime 100 Bravo. Two skunks vectoring our position at Point 66. They said, Roger, come up beeper, 2828. We did that, was in the water maybe 20 minutes, and then we were, were rescued. I've been asked many times what it was like to be coming down in the parachute after shooting down the three makes, jumping out of a flaming jet with enemy PT boats coming to get us. What was going through my mind at that particular moment? Hmm. My answer very simply was perhaps I made an incorrect decision in leaving the Army Reserves back in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a, a real story. When the airplane started waving itself after we got hit, it rolled and I told Willie we were losing hydraulics and the airplane went upside down like this. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be a prisoner of war, and I don't want to die. God, get me out of this. And I put kick the left rudder like this, and I got it to roll and go like this. And I remember I could see the Gulf of Tonkin 
and got it going straight. And I went to Burner to try and get there as fast as I could. And I remember thinking, God didn't have anything to do with this. It was just my flying skills that did this. <laughs> but the airplane went back upside down, and I said, God, I didn't mean it. Get my butt out of here. True story. <laughs> wow. Now, Willie, I'd always briefed Willie that if we ever had to go out of the airplane, because some other pilots, just so their pilots said eject for some reason, and they punched out. I would say, Willie, eject, 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 and we go out on the third one. I only got out Willie E and bang, we were gone. <laughs> well done, Willie. Well done. That's all you I know, can say. The, the, the last part of that story, you know, what you're supposed to do if you uh, get rescued is you're supposed to take the air crew out to dinner and buy them drinks, anything they want. Um, they didn't know what to do with us the next day we were on board the Constellation. I had the duty that morning, and... Then we came, we flown to you, Saigon, and then back to the States. And we toured around the country for the next 10 months making presentations to different groups. So I always felt bad that I never got to thank the air crew that came out and rescued us. About eight or nine years ago, I got a call from a fellow that said, Willie, I'm the commanding officer of that helicopter squadron, HC-7, that rescued you guys. We're having a reunion in Las Vegas. Can you come as our guest speaker? I said, Absolutely. So I came to the hotel in Las Vegas. They were all there, about 150 of them with their families in this uh, big conference room. I walked up to the podium and said, here's my credit card. I'm about 35 years late. Do with it what you want. And they did. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I could listen to stories like this for the next three hours, I think. But... I did tell Randy that I was going to let him talk a little bit about his airplane. We already know the best-looking MiG is one with smoke coming out the back of it, right? It, on it, fire. It, yeah, on fire. <laughs> but, Randy, I'm going to ask you real quick, hey, um, talk to the people a little bit about your airplane, how it flies, uh, the armament, et cetera, and then, then we're going to open it up to questions after that. Sure. Thanks for being here, by the way. Oh, you're, you guys are more well, This is a great honor for me. This is uh, – um, I'm, I'm having a blast. This is awesome. Uh, what you have is a Russian design MiG 17F. F is a designation for the uh, first version with an afterburner. Uh, one of the things that uh, made the missiles that these guys were shooting more successful. And these guys, they didn't have afterburners back there that you were shooting at, or did they? No, oh, yeah. Yeah, they yeah, did. yeah, the F they model did. was uh, the one that they that okay. they uh, right. they, so they, they uh, splashed. So um, the aircraft doesn't have uh, hydraulics in the pitch. It does have it in a roll. But the uh, wing design, uh, some of you guys that are sitting more along the wing, you can tell it has a 48 degrees wing sweep to the second fence and only about a 38 degree from there to the wing tip, I believe. Also, it's two different airfoils. It has a much sharper wing in the inner board and a lot more camber on the outside. And that camber, when you get the jet up at a high, uh, high velocity uh, knots or Mach, cause the uh, airflow to get over the top of that wing very accelerated, causing a high pressure on top of that L line and making it very difficult for the pilot to roll the jet. Uh, they modified the the uh, uh, hydraulic system on the on the flight controls twice, if I read right. That uh, increased the pressure and the and the uh, leverage on that. But it's still a the the design doesn't have a slat like the Phantom does. It doesn't have a uh, roll spoiler like a modern fighter does. So if you get the airplane uh, really um, hauling the mail, it doesn't want to roll well. It turns fantastic. It allowed to turn anything until the F-16 flew in '74. Once you get it over on a bank. Um, uh, so the reason why we wanted to always fight it in the uh, vertical and not in the, in the horizontal, don't get into a turning fight with the jet. Um, how about G's? How many G's could you pull with that thing? Um, we're limited here because we don't have a cat one box for the show this year, but, uh, at a normal at air show, although I'll fly that maneuver this afternoon, uh, I enter the maneuver at about 320 knots, uh, in AB and it goes straight to AG's and an AG horizontal turn. Uh, demonstrate the turning capability of the aircraft, and the aircraft will do that complete turn in a 4,000 foot runway. You can yeah. do it if you want to really, uh, you know, hurt yourself. Um, and then from that maneuver uh, at a typical air show, go right out of that maneuver into a half Cuban. So the idea is to, that fighter pilots would understand G the jet up a lot and put a lot of induced drag on it, and then go from that right into a vertical maneuver. Um, so it, it makes for it makes for a great air show jet like that. Well, we're really happy to bring this aircraft, particular one, because it has all its guns on it. Yeah. And so that uh, these two commanders and uh, American heroes can uh, point at the 
guns, and uh, you guys can see what they what they fought against for real. And that was the the standard configuration for back when they were fighting it back there, the thirty seven and the twenty three. Correct. They 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 eventually grew or added on missiles to the aircraft towards the very end. Uh, but I don't know that any of them ever made it into combat. I've seen the photos and so forth. And then the aircraft later on have would carry ATOL missiles on them as well. Oh, but they, they were shooting ATOLs at you guys too, right? They had ATOLs when, when you guys were fighting them too, right? I'm sorry? Did they have ATOL missiles? Uh, they, yeah, they, they had eight, uh, ATOLs. Yep, okay. Yeah. So, that, so. Most of them didn't. They had just the 23 and the 37. Okay, correct. But it got your attention too. Okay. Yeah. All right. I said I was going to give my, uh, so, uh, 10 minutes. So I'm going to give us 10 minutes for questions now. Let me ask so. you, we've got over in the EA tent, uh, we're going to be, Willie and I are going to be selling our books. So I got to put my kids through college. So you come <laughs> over. <laughs> and I think afterwards, you're going to be back in the merchandise building back here, uh, signing books also. His book is Fox 2. Uh, and Willie, you're going to be back there too with your book. Okay. Yeah. Great. They're only 20 bucks. Great Christmas present. Great stories, and and like I said, we we've, we've only uh, you know uh, hit the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, he talks about all the other Mick kills and everything else that went on, and uh, it is like I say, I've I've read it forever. So, um, okay, questions. Let's go. We got ten minutes worth of questions. Yeah, I'm just curious as to uh, has any one of you flown both a F four and a Mick seventeen or a twenty one, and how do how do they compare as far as flying characteristics? What? Got any, got any uh, MiG time? Have you you ever been in a uh, MiG yes, 21 or a MiG 17? 17 in Area 51, which gave me a, a, a good uh, opportunity to see what the airplane would do. Uh, the MiG 21, I flew against it uh, just like I, I got to fly against the F-22 and the F-15 and F-16. It gives you a real sense of what your enemy can do. How about Willie in the Tomcat? Did you get a chance? They had a program, and it's declassified now, called the Red Eagle, uh, the Red Eagle Squadron. But we had exploited uh, some of the Soviet airplanes way back when, and I was fortunate to participate in that. And I flew an F-4 against a MiG-23. And I don't know, Willie, did you get a chance to uh, to fly against any of the the Soviet fighters in the uh, Tomcat? What happened was um, I I've been out of the Navy about seven or eight years. I was in the reserves, and and we got invited up. There's a place that the Air Force has called Area 51 which at the time was a very secret uh, base about uh, 65, 70 miles northeast of Nellis Air Force Base in the, uh, Nevada. And the, the invitation said, it's going to be uh, you and Duke Cunningham in an F-4. I said, great. We're going to go. God, my old buddy, we're going to be back together in an F-4. And you're going to be going up to, uh, to Nellis, and you're going to fly against uh, MiG-17s and MiG-21s at this special place. Uh, you're not going to be able to land there, uh, but... Uh, you're going to get uh, two flights in the morning against uh, MiG-17s and two flights in the afternoon against MiG-21s. Remember, Keith Sheehan was flying the MiG-17 and Chuck Heatley was flying the MiG-21. And we got ourselves in the exact same situation, and he was behind us, uh, the MiG-17 flown by a, a former Top Gun instructor named Keith Sheehan, call sign Sheik. And you did the same thing, the idle speed brakes, he flew out in front, he said, I should have known better. But, uh, <laughs> it, it didn't end well for him. Uh -huh. the, uh, we were in a vertical fight that afternoon against a uh, MiG-21. And uh, strangely enough, we lost sight of him. Remember, he was back at our deep six right on the deck. And we're up at the top going in a vertical fight. Well, when we picked him up again, we were in huge trouble. So we did the best we could trying to hold him off. But uh, my experience was, uh, it was it was a thrill to be back with Randy in an F-4 going against uh, real MiGs. But... It was absolutely probably the best flight I've ever had in a in a in a, a fighter plane because we were over at the United States in American airspace, airplanes flown by U.S. Top Gun pilots, and they weren't there were not any missiles or bullets being launched at us. It was just a fun day of flying. It was really a thrill. We had five flights that day against them. It was special. Outstanding. All right, we got another question over here. Commander Cunningham, uh, when uh, you shot down. Uh, Colonel Toon, I guess in one of the best dog fights you ever had, probably the hardest. Uh, it was, but that was never documented. When I went into, uh, after the, the next day, I had always refused to talk to the press after our kills because they were left-wing SOBs that, that <laughs> didn't tell the right story and made the, the military look bad. So I refused, but and on my third kill, uh, Admiral Hutch Coop in CTF-77 said, Duke, I want you to go to Saigon. 
and we did. We went to uh, Saigon to listen to that. It happened to be we had three Australian strippers that day uh, <laughs> at, at the uh, the thing. But well, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay. was, there, was there really a One, Colonel Tune, or was this a Soviet pilot that uh, that you was fighting? Do you know? Was this guy a real guy, or was it a Soviet pilot yeah. that you were flying? Was, was, was there a real Colonel Tune, or was this kind of an urban legend? Oh, Colonel Tune, no. Yes, sir. Uh, when I got to Blue Chip that same day, is where they ran the Air Force, and a four-star uh, Air Force guy came up and said, Duke, do you know who you shot down? And I said, no, I don't have a clue. Well, we don't listen to the radios. And he said this guy named Colonel Tune, who had 13 kills. That was never... A, a, there was a guy named Nguyen Van Tu that I killed that day. But the, we think there was a mistake. There, uh, supposedly, there was never a Colonel Tune to the fact. And so that's what I tell everybody. All right, one more question over here. Uh, for Cunningham and Driscoll, when did you get your Caterpillar pins? When did what? Caterpillar pins. I, I'm not familiar with the Caterpillar. So the Caterpillar Club, when you bail out, and that silk oh, yeah. saves your life. They usually give you a little silkworm pen. Did you ever receive one of those? A cat no, I got, uh, we, uh, like Willie said, we, we got with the HC. I bought the guys that rescued us. Our pilot is in the helicopter. I used to make fun of Marines and helicopters, the prettiest damn airplane I ever saw. And <laughs> the pilot's name was Driscoll that, that picked me up. Another guy picked up Willie. We got, uh, I, get, I bought them a case of uh, scotch for the thing, but we never got a so it caterpillar. It sounds like they got a caterpillar pen, sorry. And, and for, uh, for Randy on the MiG-17, um, sourcing parts for your aircraft, uh, how are you handling ejection seat parts, or what do, you, what do you do to keep the airplane going with regards to the ejection seat? Well, it, uh, it is a, a true labor of love, I guess you could say, it's, uh, and it's, we've been doing it for I've been around warbirds my, and since I was a kid, so it's uh, my total, entire adult life. We have a significant parts inventory uh, in Tyler, Texas, where we keep the aircraft when they're not on the on the air show circuit. I have some great people that uh, work for us over on the side there, um, Aaron Kelly uh, in the red. I uh, was Navy AT on Hornets for uh, a number of years. Uh, next next to her is uh, we call him dad uh, bill is his name but we call him dad he was a f100 uh, engine guy in vietnam uh, his daughter um dr elkins and uh bill uh, coberson beside her uh, we have a pretty good parts inventory this airplane has an engine in it right now that's got about 21 or two hours on it total time that was uh the winter project was put a new engine in it so Any all guys of that stuff is force yeah, we got some Air You know what you put on the bottom of a Coke bottle at an Air Force base? <laughs> Open other end? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I hope that helps. Oh, here uh, we go. Uh, I, I, was, I was just waiting how long. It took about 53 minutes to get there, but I knew uh, it was coming, you know. All right, up there with a the make pilot. One, one, two, one, two. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you. Before I ask a question, I'd like to see, say very thank you very much, Randy who keep history for Soviet history, because now in Russia, no plane, no, no MiG-17 alive. Thank you very much, Randy. What are you welcome. And questions, please. Uh, when you hit MiG-17, what the pilot uh, inside in the cabin, Korean, Chinese, or Russian, or, or, or Soviet military pilot? What did he say? I'm, I'm sorry. What, what, what kind of pilots you thought were flying? Chinese, Russian, or Vietnamese? Oh, they, they were Vietnamese. And matter of fact, I went back to Vietnam. A family of one of the pilots that Willie and I shot down didn't survive. And the family asked us if we would have lunch with them. And I got a little bit hesitant. But we had a two-hour lunch and sat with them. At the end of the two hours, they came up to me and hugged me and said, Lieutenant Cunningham, you are now our new brother. I don't know about you, but I cried like a baby. It, it was very difficult. Oh, yeah. Okay, we've got uh, one right there with the plaid shorts on. Go ahead. Uh, uh, hi, uh, just uh, the F-4 did not have an internal gun, which I guess as Vietnam 
carried on uh, the, uh, I guess it was... Uh, the E-model did, by the, the way. E which was an Air Force model. But there the Navy, if I recall, the Navy models never carried an internal gun. Would that, been a, would that have made much of a difference for you? Uh, did, would the gun have been um, but much different or... or you know, I mean, I know it was... I know where you're going. It, yeah. What he's saying is that, you know, the airplane was originally designed to much. use missiles to shoot the other airplanes way out there and not to get into dogfights. And, uh, and, yeah, they didn't give you a gun. They right. later oh. modified the airplane. They put the gun on the F-4E, okay? But they also had gun pods that they could mount on your airplanes. And I, I thought I remember reading somewhere where you said, hey, if I had a gun, I could have probably killed another couple of MiGs. And uh, any reason that uh, they didn't use the gun pods and uh, you didn't carry them? You know, for the Navy, we were always weight sensitive uh, coming on and off carriers. And, you know, my my sense with, with all that I saw, I was always, uh, it would have been nice to have had a gun because a, a couple of raking gun kills perhaps would have occurred. But the amount of time, and knowing, knowing how you are, wild man, the amount of time to make sure we had a good shot, um, most of the time. Two kills in World War II on Japanese airplanes, but he also crashed three of her own. Yeah. So he calls himself a generic ace, you know. But no, I think <laughs> you guys are legitimate aces, and I thank you so much for your, your words, your expertise. We got books inside. And, and they you are really do me a favor. These are our last vote. Trump Navy aces. <laughs> All right, I'll wrap wrap it up. But but uh, Willie's got one thing to say here, and that's fine. I just want to say that uh, in my experience, the character of warfare changes with the times. Different tactics, different weapon systems, different threats. The nature of warfare never changes. The tension, the anxiety, the stress, and the fear. What I'd like to do is ask all the veterans to again, please stand. All the veterans, please stand. And I'm going to share with you something that Herman Melville said shortly after President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated as follows. There's a sobbing of the strong and a pall upon the land, but the people in their weeping bear the iron hand. Beware the people weeping when they bear the iron hand. Ladies and gentlemen, you are looking at what was once the iron hand of the United States of America. Thank you again for your service. Great respect and admiration for all. With that, I'm gonna say thank you, Duke. It has been an absolute honor. Uh, thank you for what you and Willie did way back when and, and the instruction that you've given, given since then. I'm, I'm a product of that. I'll tell you that right now. Thank you. Randy, thanks for bringing the airplane here. And Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And just very much. in case you were wondering, Randy just gave me a, a MIG coin. I, I told him earlier, I said, I said, these guys might just kind of wing it, you know, and, and, and throw it away. But I don't think so. But it's a uh, fighterjets.com. Fighter it's got a MIG on, uh, on the back side of it. It's got a red star on the front of it. And he, he told me something very, very interesting. You can put it on a table and you can spin it. And it's got a star there. So wherever the point on the star ends, you know, that's who buys well, the it's, drink. It's, so. on the, it's on the nose of the jet. There's a little uh, triangle on the, on the nose of the jet that uh, points basically the same direction the jet is. And it got a little raised spot on it not that you would ever show up at a bar or anything but if 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 you did by no fault of your own and you were suspended and it pointed to somebody that was supposed to buy not that you would play that game for real but at any rate it's uh my pleasure and and uh Thank you. true honor to be here with you guys If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.